Well, it's been another hot, dry summer here in California. And once again, I was away from the garden for three weeks straight fighting wildfires here in Northern California and growing a mustache. So today I'll give you a tour of the garden, show you what's growing, show you how it's doing after all that time away. But this tour is gonna to be a little bit different than previous tours because I'm also gonna show you a few things that I haven't shared at all here on YouTube or on Instagram. I'll show you some really cool, unique, tropical and subtropical plants that I've been collecting for a big future project. I'll talk about some upcoming projects and show you a sneak peek at my biggest project right now, which is building the raised garden beds where I'll eventually be growing all of my vegetables. A lot of fun projects coming up, so be sure to subscribe if you want to see those. We'll start here in the tomato garden because my garden is in a huge transition right now with most of the areas where I was growing my previous summer gardens either planted out with permanent crops like my orchard back here that we'll visit next or they're under construction with my new raised beds that I'll eventually be growing all of this in which are right here and we'll visit that at the end of this video. So during this transition I'm really having to decide what to grow and where to grow it and for me probably for you tomatoes are always the priority in the summer garden so they get the prime spot last year i was growing cucumbers on this livestock panel trellis this is a trellis that i love for growing any vertical crop i've grown cucumbers tomatoes squash beans peas melons anything tall or vining will do really well on these and i've got a full video on how i make these trellises that i'll link in this video but i'm getting back to growing tomatoes on these and they work really well, but there is a little bit of maintenance involved and I'll cover that maintenance shortly. But first I wanna start by talking about some of the varieties that I'm growing here. And the first one you might notice is where I have the most of these tomatoes and there's a reason for that. And it's the reason that this is one tomato that I always have in my garden. These are new girl tomatoes, very similar to the early girl tomato, which I've been growing for almost a decade before discovering this improved variety basically of the early girl, which is the new girl. And it's not the most unique variety. It's not the most delicious variety, but for me, it's the most reliable and productive variety. It's the first one to produce in spring. It's the last one to keep producing in the fall, but most importantly, it's the one that produces through the summer heat here in Sacramento. We've got pretty hot and dry summers mid to high 90s most summer and a lot of days over 100 today i think it's going to be 103 and what happens with most tomato varieties is you'll see them grow tall the plants look great and they're putting on a ton of flowers but they're not putting on more fruit through that midsummer at least here because that pollen gets sterilized in that 90 degree range depending on the variety it doesn't happen as much with cherry tomatoes but most mid to large size tomatoes they're not really fruiting much through summer this is the exception. These new girl and also the early girl will put on fruit through that heat. So that to me makes it a very valuable variety. If there was one variety that I would grow, if I could only grow one, it would be this because it's just super reliable and super productive. I'm also growing one variety of tomatillos on this trellis. Now the one and only variety of tomatillos that I grow, this very rare and unique yellow long tomatillo known as the Queen of Malinalco. And I've shown this in previous garden tour videos, but it is by far the best and most unique tomatillo I've ever grown. Possibly the only tomatillo I'll ever continue to grow because it is absolutely delicious in salsas as you would use a normal tomatillo, but it's also excellent just eating fresh like this. And so I've been saving the seeds from this variety because the company that I used to buy the seeds from doesn't sell them anymore. And I don't even know where you can buy them these days. So I save these seeds. I do actually propagate these plants and sell them at my annual garden sale here. Otherwise, I'm not sure where you can get them. But if you can find Queen of Malinalco seeds, I highly recommend these seeds. It is unlike any tomatillo you've ever tasted. Sweet, tropical, delicious. Mm. So, so good. 
As far as maintenance for this trellis goes, as you can see, I've got tomatoes that are overgrowing the trellis right now. It's a five foot tall panel. If you wanted to, you could put these panels on end and make them eight feet tall. They come in 16 feet. So really you can make them 16 feet or anywhere below that if you wanted to. But five feet works for me because even though these tomatoes, as you can see mid season have already outgrown it. What happens with a five foot tall trellis is it really allows you 10 feet plus of growing space because what will happen is the tomatoes get to the five feet height, then you just let them topple over the other side and they can grow downward. They start fruiting below their early season. By the time they get to the top, most of these crops down here have already been harvested. So the crops become higher and higher and then they'll topple over that side. That said, you can't really just like let them go wild. Having been gone for three weeks now, they sort of have, so they have a lot of suckers going on here. So what I really wanna do now is just come in and prune back some of these suckers. It's sort of like with the lower and lean system, you can allow your tomatoes to be grown to one single stem if you want to. What I normally like to do is start them out with between three and five stems, depending on the size of the tomato. So a large beefsteak tomato, that's gonna have fewer stems, maybe three stems for something like this um, Cherokee purple tomato that I have right here. But for a smaller tomato, like a cherry tomato, I'll sort of let that grow wild. So I'll let that continue to branch out and branch out because it can support and create fruit on all those branches, unlike a larger variety like this. So the reason that we sucker prune the branches off these larger varieties is because, well, they really can't support that much fruit on the amount of flowers that they're creating. And it takes a lot of energy to create all of these branches. And I know it's bringing in energy. The leaves are kind of like solar panels, so they're photosynthesizing and bringing in energy. But if they're trying to start all these flowers, that's taking away a lot of energy that we want to direct into the fruit. So I'll sucker prune back most of these branches. I'll look and make sure they don't have fruit set on them already and I'll kind of just thin this out a little bit. So I cleaned up a bunch of those suckers that were in here that will help with airflow to prevent disease and fungus on these tomatoes. It'll also allow in sunlight to help ripen up some of the green tomatoes. You can see some beautiful tomatoes here now. We've got a striped German and some Cherokee purple tomatoes in here. The tops of these plants are, as I said, over the top, but they're gonna continue fold over and they'll produce more fruit as they're growing kind of downward and hanging. I wanna show you quickly how I trellis these through here. So these plants, they're tomatoes, so they don't have vines and tendrils that will naturally climb. They're just gonna kinda of wanna grow up and they're gonna fall out to the side. So the maintenance that I do, aside from that pruning, is just gently weaving the tomato plants through here. So every couple of days or every couple of weeks, I'll push and pull the tomatoes into this trellis, sort of encouraging them to weave through this. So it's not just plant them and they're gonna do it on their own. You do have to actually come out here to the trellis every week or so to encourage them to go back and forth through the wire. But it's pretty simple. And if you stay on top of it, it works very, very well. Now I'm on the back side of the tomato trellis, which is west facing, and I'm on the south end of it where I grow most of my cherry tomatoes. And those are two design factors that contribute to the success of this trellis. It's north to south orientation, allows for full sun in the morning on the east facing side. As the sun comes over midday in the afternoon, we get full sun here on the west facing side. So it allows a good amount of sunlight without sun scolding the tomatoes. So if this was set up east to west, well, what happened is the north side of the trellis gets way too much shade, the south side gets way too much sun, and then we get sun scolding on the side of the tomatoes. So anytime you can set up your garden in general, but especially trellises like this, north to south, that's the way to go. And then the cherry tomatoes on this side, the reason I have them here is because I've got a big orange tree right here, which lets very little light come through. And the larger the tomato variety you have, the more sunlight it requires. So if you're limited on light or if you're growing in an area of your garden that's limited on light and you want to grow tomatoes there, cherry tomatoes, small, maybe medium sized tomatoes are the way to go. Prioritize the brightest, most sunlight rich areas of the garden for your larger beefsteak tomatoes. In here with the cherry tomatoes, I've got a lot of my favorite varieties. I've got these purple bumblebee tomatoes. 
I've got sunrise bumblebee tomatoes, sun gold tomatoes, pink bumblebee tomatoes, and then all the way here on the south end in the most shady spot of the tomato garden, I'm growing these Sweet Prince tomatoes, which are a new variety from Row 7 Seeds. And considering they are almost in like full day shade over here under this tree, it's got a decent crop growing on it. It would have a lot more fruit if it was in full sun, but I'm happy with the production based on its situation. And they're pretty tasty. All right, let's go check out the orchard and we'll start with the figs. Right next to the tomatoes, I've got this fig tree. This is a blackjack fig. It's been in the ground for two years now. And this year it's putting on its first crop. It had a crop in spring and now it's got its big summer crop. But one of the things I'm really liking about this tree is that it's setting fruit for a long season. So I've got a lot of fruit that's ready to harvest today. I've got some that are a week or two out and then I've got a couple that are about a month plus out. And that's a really cool characteristic and I think it's something that's unique for fig trees, at least in my experience. A lot of varieties will set a big crop all at once and then you have to figure out what to do with all of that fruit, making jam or drying them and that's all great. But me, I prefer fresh figs right off the tree. So having a variety that will set fruit for a long season, giving me the ability to harvest fresh figs for one, maybe even two months in this case, is a really cool scenario. These are really similar to a mission fig. The most common fig that I see in this area, at least, they're this purple fig, red on the inside. But to me, these have a superior flavor to the mission fig. Mission figs are very jammy, have a lot of spice notes, but I prefer like a more berry flavor in my fig because I like them fresh and these have a really nice kind of strawberry flavor to them. Hmm. Really, really nice fig. Let's go check out another fig tree. This is my panache fig, also known as a tiger stripe fig, and it's my favorite variety hands down for a couple of reasons. It's a yellow fig with these unique green stripes, and on the inside has this beautiful red flesh. But the best part, it tastes like raspberry jam amazing fresh berry notes all the way through. I hear a lot of people say that they do not like figs and I can appreciate that, but I think one of the reasons is that most of them have only ever had the purple figs and a lot of them got those in the grocery store. So figs, like tomatoes, cannot be harvested when they're fully ripe and then shipped and kept on a the shelf. They're gonna go bad instantly because the sugars are so high. So what you get in the grocery store is nothing like what you can harvest and grow at home. So if you can get your hands on a homegrown fig, it's gonna be a completely different flavor than what you get at the grocery store. And then the other side of it is there are tons of different fig varieties. Those purple mission figs are what I most commonly see at the stores and at the markets. And I think they're delicious, but they do have a jammy kind of spice note flavor to them. Whereas the berry varieties like this panache fig have much more of the berry flavor. So if you like berries, you're probably gonna like a fig like this. This particular tree, is extra special to me because I actually grew this tree from a cutting that I propagated from a tiger stripe fig tree at my original urban farmstead. I have a full video showing how simple it is to propagate fig cuttings. And in that video, this is actually one of the trees that I propagated. So it's cool to see it here, all grown up now, putting on its first crop. Right next to that fig tree, I've got a jujube. Yes, jujube actually is a fruit. It's not just some old fashioned candy that you find at the movie theater. Somewhat similar to an apple harvested in fall, just like an apple has a nice white crispy flesh, but a bit more dry and less acidic than an apple. Has a nice sweet flavor and a small pit inside. This is a larger variety of jujube. It's called Lee. And these are almost full grown at this size. I like to harvest them when they're nice and fresh and crispy on the tree. You can actually leave these on the tree and they'll turn brown and dry up a bit and have a very similar flavor to a date. And that's why they're also nicknamed a Chinese date. One of the things that I love about the jujube is that it thrives in a hot, dry climate, just like we have here in Sacramento. But I don't see a lot of people growing them, especially commercially. It's hard to find them in the grocery stores. And I think one of the reasons 
is that they have these gnarly thorns all over the branches. So pruning them, harvesting them is kind of a pain. I know I wouldn't want to be in charge of harvesting a jujube orchard with all these gnarly thorns. Most of the other trees in this orchard have been harvested already. I've got a full series showing the creation and maintenance so far on this orchard, and I'll continue to make videos every year as this orchard establishes. So if you're growing fruit trees or if you're interested in growing fruit trees, I highly recommend checking those out and consider subscribing. My next big project for this section of the garden will be widening this pathway. Currently, I have a narrow concrete pathway that was here when I moved in. And on this side, I've got the remnants of my old vegetable garden when I had rows going all along here. But I'm gonna remove all of this and create about a six foot wide decomposed granite pathway right down the center. It's also gonna serve as a bocce ball court and a space where I can set long tables down the center of the orchard to host dinners with some chef friends of mine. Of course, I'll have full videos showing this project. And part of this project will also be blueberries potted blueberry bushes down both sides of the pathway, probably some large terracotta pots with a variety of different blueberries. And I actually have a lot of those blueberry varieties already. So let's go look at those. I'm back here under the orange tree in one of two nursery sections of the garden. So I've got two sections like this where I have a lot of potted plants that I've got from the nursery and don't quite have spaces that I've created for them yet. I have plans for each of them and where I think I want them to go but those are future projects. So I'll bring them home. I'll usually put them in a larger pot, improve the soil a little bit, and then put them in an area that's a little bit shaded, even though most of these will thrive in full sun and that's where they'll go eventually. Keeping them in shade just makes them a little bit less maintenance for now, but the fruit's not as good. So I've got my blueberries right here. They're in the shade and they're also underneath this netting. It's kind of like a bug netting. It's a very fine netting. so. I don't really need a bug netting for blueberries, but I wanted something to keep the birds off of this. And the netting with the bigger holes seems to kind of snag on the branches and the berries. So I like this fine mesh stuff for them, but it's pretty much just there for the birds. So I've got a lot of different varieties in here, and I won't know which ones are gonna do great here in Sacramento until I get them in the sun in the areas where they're gonna thrive. But most of them are doing just fine in here under the shade. Like I said, they're not gonna fruit that well with this much shade, but the plants look really nice. So some of the varieties I have are Sunshine, I've got a Jewel, got Spartan, O'Neill, South Moon, Star, Emerald, Misty Blue, Biloxi, and a Huckleberry. So a wide variety here, I'll probably get a couple more. It's nice to have a variety of blueberries for pollination, but one thing that I really always try to do in this garden is try a variety so that I can see not only what works for me, but also be able to share the characteristics of these varieties to give you an idea of what might work well in your garden. So these are the blueberries that will hopefully be along that pathway by spring. A couple of other unique things that I have growing right here. This right here is called a jabuticaba or Brazilian grape tree. It's in the myrtle family. So it's very similar to like a crepe myrtle, which do really well here in Sacramento, but it's a tropical fruit tree that has a very unique type of fruit. These little, uh, they look like a dark purple grape and they grow all along the trunk of this tree. So they don't grow out of the tips like a normal fruit or berry might grow. They actually attach onto the trunk. And if you've ever seen pictures of these trees, they look wild. Supposedly, they taste really good. They take a long time to fruit, and this thing was pretty expensive in this large pot, but they're slow growing, so I wanted to get a head start on it, and I'm excited for that one. Right here, I've got a papaya tree. It's called a babaco papaya. It doesn't require pollination and right now it actually has a bunch of papayas on it which is really cool i bought this thing it was only about a foot and a half tall and now it's shoulder height on me so it's doing pretty well this thing will go in the ground hopefully sometime this spring as well this section of the garden to my right is all going to be tropicals and subtropicals it's a big future project i have going but i've already started to 
acquire many of the varieties that will go there, including this little tree right here. This is a mango, it's called a manila mango. It's supposed to do well in my zone. I know people here who are growing them and they seem to be thriving. We're here now on the south side of my house between my house and this fence that I share with my neighbors on this narrow pathway that serves as another temporary nursery for about 25 different varieties of tropicals and subtropicals that I'll eventually plant out in the garden. But for the past six months and probably the next six months, they'll be right here along my house and they've thrived right here. It's a really good spot because even in wintertime when the sun is low, they get good sunlight and then they get good reflective heat from the stucco siding of my house. Then right now in summertime, when it's really hot, they actually get good filtered light through these 100 year old sycamores that line the street in front. I'm assuming the trees are 100 years old because my house is 102, probably planted around the same time. But these tropicals and subtropicals, they like that heat, they like the sun, but they like the filtered light a bit more because too much direct sun can start to burn them. So that filtered light is really nice and that means I haven't had to protect them with shade cloth or anything this summer. I did protect them one time last winter with frost cloth just because we got pretty cold and I wanted to be sure even though most of these varieties are cold hardy tropicals and subtropicals, they all probably started in greenhouses that were warmer than what they're used to. So I wanted to kind of help them acclimate a bit. And then after this, I'm not gonna be protecting them at all because I just wanna see what's gonna survive here. And that's part of my plan with this project is work in a bunch of tropicals and subtropicals, kind of see what works well, be able to show you guys what can grow in a marginal climate. There's a lot of other garden channels out here that are doing the same thing around Sacramento and in the Central Valley. I've learned a lot from them and I look forward to kind of contributing to that content to help you all find what kind of tropicals and subtropicals might grow in your marginal climate if you're in one of those. This grand name banana is one that I found through that. It's a cold hardy banana, good down to 20 degrees. I've seen a few other people grow it in neighboring areas to here and it's looks like it's doing pretty well for them. It's surviving and thriving here. I don't have fruit on it yet, but I think I will next summer. Right behind the banana, I have two more papaya trees. There's a strawberry papaya and a Mexican papaya. Both of these were about a foot tall when I brought them home from the nursery and they grow super fast. So now they're taller than I am and they actually have flowers on them that will hopefully set fruit soon. These two varieties I've seen other gardeners grow here in the Central Valley and get a lot of fruit for them. So I'm pretty confident that these will do well, especially once I get them in the ground. This is my lemon guava tree. It's one of about six or so varieties of guava that I'm growing. I've got white guava, pink guava, Chilean guava, strawberry guava, um, pineapple guava, maybe one or two other ones, but guavas seem to do really well here. They thrive in the heat and they're also cold hardy down to about the mid 20s, depending on the variety. This one has a lot of fruit on it right now and most of the other varieties of guava that I've grown so far have also fruited within the second year. So great subtropicals to grow in these marginal climates. There are a lot of other fruit trees I wanna show you in this area, but for this video, let's just look at one more. This is by far the plant that I'm most excited about in my entire garden. It's something that I didn't even realize existed until about a year ago. And then about six months ago, I actually had an opportunity to taste one of these fruits that I got at a farmer's market in Southern California. And it instantly became my new favorite fruit but it was somewhat bittersweet, not the flavor. The flavor was delicious. The experience was bittersweet because I had only ever seen it in Southern California. So it's kind of a bummer that I couldn't get them up here in Northern California. And then I did some research and found out that this variety can actually grow pretty well and probably thrive here in the Central Valley and in Northern California. And then all of a sudden I was at my local nursery and they had one of these trees. I brought it home. And this thing has fruit on it right now, the first year bringing it home and it's in this pot. So this is a white sapote. The fruit on here is looking really nice. This is about halfway to maturity. If you've ever had the opportunity to taste this fruit, it sort of tastes like a tropical custard. The texture is kind of like avocado, but the flavor is tropical and sweet 
no acidity, just an amazing, unique flavor for a fruit. Nothing I've ever tasted before. This variety is Vernon. There's also another variety that I have called Subel, both of which do well here supposedly in Northern California as far as the cold hardiness and our summer heat. There's a lot of varieties for white sapote. There's also black sapote. Uh, it's also called like a chocolate sapote. I've eaten those. They're also really good, but a completely different flavor from this. So I just, I am so, so excited for this tree and I cannot believe that it's already setting fruit for me. I really hope this makes it all the way to maturity and I'll show you guys maybe a little tasting video this fall, hopefully. The last thing I wanna show you in this garden tour is the future site of my vegetable garden. The raised beds that I've had plans for since moving into this house a few years ago and that I've been working on for the last few months, but I haven't really shown at all yet. So let's go take a sneak peek of those. Almost finished here. I've got four of the eight beds built. They're all eight feet long, four feet wide, 18 inches deep, built out of this four by six rough cut redwood. I've got water stub outs to each of them. I've got low voltage electrical to each bed so I can add down lights to each one. And of course I'm making videos showing this entire process. One video will show all of the prep work for the surface and the underground utilities. The other video will show actually building these beds. So if you want to see those upcoming videos, be sure to subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. And as always, if you have any questions at all, ask them in the comments below. Happy gardening, everyone.